What a success by DeepL to literally edge out Google Translate. More than 60 M&A transactions um, of various types and not quite 20 startup and tech funding rounds. It's so important to have somebody who understands not only like the target audience, but also the history of the audience. Welcome everyone to episode 101 of Slater Pod. Hi, Esther. Hi, Florian. How's it going? Oh, good. Today we are talking about game localization, specifically all things Japanese, and we have a fantastic guest for this. Katrina Leonudakis joins us today, Japanese English localization specialist at Sega, but also a freelance Japanese translator. Perfect combo. There's mm, such a... Two in one. Uh, two in one, plus, uh, you know, big Twitter following, and uh, she, you know, this is super lively uh, Twitter community around game localization, specifically Japanese game localization, so we want to dig into that. Very, very interesting. And um, also, we're heading a little bit more east with SlaterCon Remote that's happening in <laughs> in like eight weeks in March, on March 16th. Uh, and we have an Aussie time zone session, oh, Esther. Early, be... early for me. That's <laughs> uh, like 1 a.m. our time. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see if I join. <laughs> so uh, Aussie time zone session. We also have the tried and trusted US and European uh, session, of course. So if you sign up, you get two for one. Um, so mm -hmm. probably the best times in there will be sitting somewhere in Dubai, maybe. I don't know. That will be the most human time zone. Uh, keynoting the ANZ session will be no other than Grand Straker. We said a, a few times that we want to have him on the podcast. Well, now we have him yeah, at SlaterCon right. Remote. And, um, you know, looking forward to that. Fantastic. Sounds good. But yeah. first, let's talk about... DeepL and Google Translate being blocked. Uh, T-Works buying uh, an LSP in Portugal. Then there's some OPI drama happening in New Zealand. And you're going to tell us a bit more about our hot off the press M&A and funding report. Yes, I will. Very good. Um, first, though, this was a super interesting story. So let me tell you more about this. So it's a mm -hmm. um, it, it, it was uh, it was reported by the most popular finance blog in Switzerland. I mean, I call it finance blog. It kind of started out, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago. And it's like, uh, I think in America, they call it like a muck raking kind of uh, oh, really? uh, publisher. Well, so they, they dig out every day. There's like another story about Credit Suisse doing this and UBS, you know, dropping the okay. ball on that. And, okay. and uh, so you like know, kind of gossip of the finance world. 100% gossip. Yeah. Like I can't, I sometimes I, I can't believe what the guy uh, who publishes it gets away with publishing. But, you know, yeah. I think he went uh, like all up the kind of judicial chain and always uh, was, um, you know, they, they always kind of freedom of the press and et cetera. So anyway, so uh, it, it's a publication called Inside Parade Plots, Parade Plots being like um, uh, the kind of the Wall Street of Zurich, right? Mm -hmm. So um, what does this have to do with translation? Uh, so somebody inside the Swiss post um told him uh the, the the journalist that they uh they blocked google translate and deep l inside the swiss post and mm -hmm. the swiss post isn't uh isn't a small kind of like legacy player they're actually kind of like switzerland's amazon almost i mean we don't have amazon here so they're they're kind of a big e-commerce player of course they're shipping all the the packages that are ordered now you know all of the, the you know gazillions of uh kind of items that are that are shipped so uh so yeah so and they also have a finance arm probably that's why they leaked it to uh uh or they leaked it they 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 told him uh, the finance blog about this, right? So they have a Swiss, mm -hmm. what is it, uh, Post Finance, and uh, it's quite a, quite a big uh, financial player. So a lot of people here are like either with UBS or Credit Suisse or with Post Finance, right? So they block Google Translate and DeepL, it's particularly DeepL, and then he wrote an article about it. It got like fifty thousand views, and it was it was so interesting. Even the former uh, kind of chairman of the post waded in on some internal chat and said like, oh, this is, uh, you know, I don't understand. This doesn't like match our, uh, the post's company culture, et cetera. Uh, it's kind of mm -hmm. unnecessary kind of nanny state type of uh, policy, et cetera. Um, 
And there was also a very interesting look at the comment section. Like, uh, there's always a super lively comment section. Uh, a lot of their, I always love to read about like how people that have zero to do with translation, zero to do with the language industry, kind of perceive the topic of translation, right? Yeah. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. So uh, probably half of them said, uh, well, it's because of confidentiality and data concerns. So, you know, it's understandable. You don't want to send your data to, you know, whatever DBEL or Google Translate. So, yes, it was mm -hmm. a good move by the post. Uh, but but others just said, yeah, I mean, you probably can't stop it. And then some actually countered that you they should just use DBEL Pro, which, of course, doesn't, like, you know, use the data and is kind of a professional enterprise solution. Um, also interesting, some of the comments that came from, uh, that they quoted in the article from people inside uh, the post. Let me just pull this oh, up yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> so one, one user complained, like, it's frustrating that you don't get uh, alternatives if you use the, po oh yeah, I have to actually mention, sorry, I forgot to mention. So they blocked deep L, but then actually force people to something called post translate, like an internal uh, MP wow, okay. solution, yeah. right? Proprietary solution, which of course it's hard to compete with deep L, right? So they, yeah. so, so the users complained that like, uh, that you're not getting any alternatives or al alternate suggestions. Right. And, and that, mm. that was the big strength of deep L. That's what they, they said, or, uh, one user at the post said that the French translations from German are erroneous and she always has to correct sentences uh, because mm -hmm. they don't make any sense in French. Yeah. Well, that's sometimes what happens when you use MT, but it's interesting that like, you know, like there's this massive quality gap between apparently what they, uh, yeah. what they launch internally and, and what DeepL uh, potentially Google translate delivers. But I think most people here would be using DeepL anyway. So, um, Okay, so you got this this setup. They they yep. blocked it. They forced users on their internal MT. Uh, former chairman wades in, etc. And then Adam Bittlingmeyer from Modelfront, who we also had on the pod, tweeted at the Post mm. Office um, or Post to the Swiss Post and kind of mentioned it, just like, "Hey, interesting story. Read it here." And then they tweet back and say. Swiss Post has opened access to DeepL again in the meantime, but not for po uh, post finance because of regulatory requirements. So they back down. So for ah. the, the general Swiss Post staff, they can now access DeepL again, uh, but not for the post finance because of regulatory requirements. Hey, I'd love to hear what those regulatory requirements are. Um, mm. There's probably some like finance thing that they have to keep every client's data like locked in some bunker in in the mountains, right? Uh, but yeah, int really interesting. But story. they opened up DeepL, but not Google. So Google still blocked, or we don't know. Uh, no, probably not blocked. Uh, I don't. I think it's just that the the discussion shifted to DeepL because like everyone's using DeepL as opposed to Google yeah. Translate. So I think they. I mean, you know, what 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 a success by DeepL to just literally edge out Google Translate, right? So it's kind of the discussion centered around DeepL. They probably can block Google Translate and nobody cares because if you unblock DeepL, right. then it's fine. But I mean, think about it from a product perspective. You get like into almost like national news because your users are so upset that access to your product gets shut off and, yeah. uh, you know, and then they actually cave and turn it back on again. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, kudos to, bowing to, to the pre to pressure. Kudos to the, yeah. Kudos to the team at deep L. Somebody from deep L is listening to this. You're more than welcome to join us on the pod and uh, tell us more about your exciting company. Mm -hmm. So, um, there was a, let's move on to M&A and we're going to talk about yeah. M&A. You're going to give us a few of the good data points from our report. But first, um, why don't you tell us more about what T-Works was up to in Portugal? Yeah. So just uh, one of the M&A stories that we covered uh, this week. This is T-Works, uh, which is the German-based LSP group. Uh, it's sort of a, a, it was originally formed as a partnership of language service providers or like a, mar a merger of three LSPs based in Germany in late 2018. They're private equity backed um, and they've been doing sort of a series of smaller, um, small ish, I should say, um, acquisitions since then. 
Um, so the latest of their acquisitions is uh, Traductonet, which is based in um, based in Portugal, as we said. Um, and they also have offices in in South America. Um, so this is after uh, T Works acquired back in 2019 Text and Form, which is Germany based, I ASI Austria based, and yeah. also Germany's Pro Langua in 2020. The most recent, um, well, prior prior to Traductnet, they also expanded into France in 2021 through the acquisition of Lexcelera. Um, and they're not so rebranding any of these companies, right? They're not uh, as far, yeah, not so far. Um, yeah. So yeah, uh, they they kind of have they do share a, a little branding um, on the website with like a little T Works logo as well. But for the most part, they operate um, well. They keep their um, original brand. Um, they also operate originally all of, uh, independently. All of these different companies, um, and they're headed up typically by the existing management. Um, but I mean, as as a group, T Works now has grown to be quite sizable. So in 2021, generated uh, around 22 million euros. So they might um, qualify for our leader status um, in this year's language service provider index if that equates to equal or more than uh, 25 million dollars. Um, but Traductonet, the the most recent acquisition was uh, well much smaller. 2.2 million euros um, in revenues in 2021. Um, overall, they have just over 200 employees, about 210. Um, yeah, so they're marching ahead with uh, various different uh, locations and territories in Europe and even further afield now. Let's see if they go to New Zealand. Maybe that's too far. Um, <laughs> that's a segue right there from Portugal to New Zealand. New Zealand. Uh, so there was a story, and it's so hard to um, summarize, plus I don't think all the facts are out, but we just wanted to write a quick news story uh, and publish it on Wednesday because apparently there's interpreters that are uh, not getting paid. It's quite a complicated situation. So mm -hmm. it's about a company called Easy Speak and E-Z-I Speak. Uh, yeah. That is one of the New Zealand government's uh, remote interpreting provider. Uh, they were owned by kind of a parent company, um, and that the parent company went into liquidation uh, in September last year. And but mm -hmm. right before they went into liquidation, they uh, sold the business to um, the the kind of existing uh, owner, right? S uh, founder owner, uh, and and then the that company continued to operate. So EasySpeak continues to operate, but was kind of snatched out of and sold uh, uh, right before it went into liquidation. And then there's some, um, you know, payments that are apparently that kind of go into the liquidation. Uh, oh my God, like a, that's a kind of a technical uh, thing, like into the liquidation uh, claims what? in a oh, sense. Oh yeah. Right. The bucket, so, the bucket of funds yeah, so, that have to be doled out to various parties. Yeah. Or you, you just say, well, the, the, those, those invoices, like the new company isn't responsible for paying those invoices, but the, you know, the, um, uh, the, the liquidated company is. And, and so there's, yep. there's, a, there's a back and forth. It's, it's, it's another story. I got to say where interpreters are left holding the bag. I'm not sure if that's the appropriate mm. expression here, but, uh, I, this I you know off the top of my head I can't recall exactly but I think I think there were a few of these stories that we covered over the years now and I don't know why it is that the uh, interpreters here are uh, you know up in arms I think we also covered stories even uh, late last year with inter interpreters striking there's something going on in Canada there was something going on in Belgium uh, mm -hmm. so this whole public sector interpreting um, industry is yeah it's just uh, tricky. It's tricky. So this tricky. Is, this is basically the the interpreters haven't been paid because Easy Speak is saying, oh, it's no longer our responsibility. It's the responsibility of the kind of liquidated entity. I mean, they're not saying it in those sort words, of. right? They're not saying but, okay. uh, it's that's what's implied by when we went to the New Zealand Society of Translators Interpreters website. So Easy Speak mm. isn't saying anything. I mean, go go to the right, article. Okay. They they have something on their website, and you know we want to be really careful that we don't put words in people's mouth. But uh, basically, that's that's apparently the the situation uh, right now. So sad, and hopefully they're going to get paid uh, at some point. And uh, you know, just I just take it's... some time to get settled. Yeah, it's, it's, but it looks really tricky. And I think these uh, interpreter um, associations are, are really doing a great job. So in this case, again, the New, uh, New Zealand Society of Transit Interpreters. So 
uh, yeah, kudos, mm. kudos to them. Moving back to the M&A front, Esther, what are some of the highlights from our you know, flagship language industry M&A and funding report that came out last week? Yeah, well, there's so many. It's hard to choose from, uh, but I will do my best. So this is the M&A and funding report that covers all of the transactions um, that we Slater covered in 2021. Um, so we've got more than 60 M&A transactions um, of various types um, and not quite 20 startup and tech funding rounds that includes growth funding also uh, covered by us in 2021. But just a couple of highlights. I picked out some of the large trade sales just to refresh people's memories in case you've forgotten. Uh, but some of the major deals um, in the in the trade sale, so effectively an LSP to an LSP uh, that happened in 2021 were uh, IUNO's acquisition, uh, which seems like a long time ago, of um, SDI Media. That was back in March 2021. Um, that actually catapulted the combined group, now called IUNO SDI, into being the, the world's largest pure play media localization provider, um, and ha which has roughly $400 million in combined revenues. So major, major player there. Uh, and yeah, the biggest. That was a long time ago. So it's feel, long I was time like, ago. surprised that we were still talking about it. But there we go. It's good to refresh our memories. A little um, more recent. Probably doesn't seem that long ago for, for SDI Media and, and I, you know. But yes, a little yeah. bit more recent. Uh, we had Transperfect's acquisition of Semantics. Um, that was back in the summer in July 2021. Um, that obviously significantly expanded Transperfect's presence in the Nordics um, and added around sort of 90 million US dollars to Transperfect. Transperfect's top line revenues on an annual basis. So again, large, large acquisition uh, there. Another one uh, that we picked out as being um, quite important from 2021, um, although smaller, um, we localize acquired NLG. Probably remember this back in July. Also, um, it rough in doing so, they roughly doubled the size of their life sciences business. So life sciences an attractive space for many LSPs and the super agencies. Um, we localize as life sciences business probably stands around 50 million US dollars, um, having doubled after they acquired NLG. Um, so those are probably three of three of the, you know, interesting, more interesting and larger uh, trade sales that we covered in amongst, of course, many, many other trade sales um, that happened right across the spectrum of uh, language service providers in 2021. Um, one other thing I'll pull out is the, uh, you know, financial investors. So typically these private equity, uh, you know, growth equity providers, um, firms, uh, very uh, influential and very active also in, in the language industry in 2021. We had a record number of, of language service provider leaders. Um, so again, like the, we're talking about the companies that are above 25 million or so in annual revenues. Record number of them were involved in private equity led transactions um, in 2021. You had people like Separatech, The Big Word, Motion Point. Uh, language wire and, and a number of others also in being involved in these private equity led transactions, whether it's selling, you know, for the first time to private equity or swapping private equity backers, um, things like this. Got it. So give Couple us of the other top data three points. data points. The top yeah, three. here we go. What you all came for. Uh, well, <laughs> so uh, fun fact, I suppose all of these are fun facts, but uh, yeah, Very we fun. had in 2021 uh, the same, the exact same number of trade sales that were covered by Slater in 2021 as in 2019. That was 47 in total. And that was twice the number um, than in 2020. So we covered 23 trade sales in 2020 and 47 in 2021 and two years ago in 2019. Um, number two, <laughs> uh, in terms of the rationale uh, as to why people acquired companies in the first place, uh, we found that um, companies' main rationale was to deepen their presence in an existing vertical um, so I mentioned, obviously, we localize, you know, doubling down basically on on life sciences through that acquisition. Perfect example um, of wanting to, you know, deepen your, your expertise um, within an existing vertical. That was the primary rationale for people generally uh, to buy companies in 2021. Uh, whereas in previous years, it's been more towards uh, the rationale 
of um, strengthening existing geographic presence. And that's still an important factor for many people and in many cases. Um, but if we boiled it down to sort of one essential rationale, uh, yeah, it came down to um, the vertical uh, presence as being the main rationale and also technology capabilities. So companies acquiring to acquiring companies to um, build, build up or acquire technology capabilities through the acquisition, that also became a more important factor as a rationale in 2021. Got it. And then can I read the last one? Yeah, of course. <laughs> or read, <laughs> talk about it. Why, because I'm uh, going to cry. <laughs> I think that's a good one, the last data point. We, I yeah. think we can we'd skip the, 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 the kind of more numeric one, but you, mm -hmm. you're, you're saying here that there were no acquisitions of UK companies by kind of continental European buyers uh, covered that we covered, us. yeah. That I mean, we covered. Caveat, I mean, that we yeah, covered. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there were maybe a couple that there were some. Sm <laughs> okay, so everyone was like, ah, yeah, maybe Brexit. We'll now. stay away. Let's, we'll let's leave, leave the Brits alone for now. Leave the Brits. Yeah. See Give what. Them their see how year. this Brexit thing shakes out. Yeah. How is it shaking out? How is life? I don't know. <laughs> You don't know. You haven't been outside for two years. No. I mean, it's hard to it's hard to dissociate. You know what's COVID and, and what's Brexit and what's just you know everything else. But yeah, you know, fun times for all of us. Absolutely. And now we're gonna have a interesting talk with uh, Katrina Leonudakis about Japanese English and generally Japanese localization in games. Looking forward to that. Great. Stay tuned. All right, and welcome back to SlaterPod. Joining us today is Katrina Leonudaikis, localization coordinator at SIG and freelance Japanese translator. Hi, Katrina. Hi, thanks for having me. Welcome thanks to the for, pod. Thanks for joining. So where does the podcast find you today? What country, what city? Uh, so I'm based out of the United States in California and Los Angeles. Great, great. Um, yeah, I want to go back there as soon as possible. We were planning. Um, but uh, oh, wow. maybe next year, maybe this year. Uh, so first up, tell us a bit more about your kind of professional background, your route into the game lock uh, industry, and how did you learn Japanese? And uh, why? Sure. Uh, well, I think, uh, <laughs> especially for a lot of people my age who learn Japanese, it always goes back to kind of like video games or anime or like watching Cartoon Network and getting into all the Dragon Ball Z stuff. So that was all me as a young kid going into a teenager. Um, I got really into anime. I was dressing up. I was going to all the conventions. Um, and I was like, I really want to learn Japanese so I can read all these comics so I don't have to wait for them to come out. Um, and yes, yeah, so I started learning a little bit on my own. Um, when I went to college, I had planned on majoring in psychology, but I was like, oh, well, I'm taking all these Japanese classes. I might as well add a Japanese major. Um, and oh, I'm going to finish early. I might as well study abroad as well. Um, and then while I was abroad in uh, Japan, I was like, oh, no, I love it here. I love the language. <laughs> I love the culture. Oh, God dang it. I so I ended up applying uh, to a master's program in translation while I was over there because I was looking at different grad schools and realized that was a lot more interesting to me than trying to go for like an MFT or something with my psychology. Um, so I ended up doing a, a break of one year between undergrad and graduate school. I went for a year on the JET program um, where I taught English in a village in Japan, um, came back, um, did my two years at Kent State University for my master's in translation, um, and then I moved back to Los Angeles and started freelancing full time. Sir, sir what, what university was that? Was that in Tokyo or another uh, Kent state? State uh, over in Ohio. Oh, Kent State. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but okay. when you were in Japan, what city were you? In? Um. So I was just about three hours west of Tokyo in Yamanashi Ken. Um. I was actually in a very small village called Doshimura. Um. It's about two thousand people. Um. It was awesome. I loved it. That helps. It was amazing. I mean, it was really good for my immersion. Um. Even yeah, though, I was just like, going to say, right? I've been there yeah. for six months, like, as a student, um, so that really helped. But having the experience as an adult, like, I had to pay my bills, I had to, like, pay my car insurance, I got into a car accident, had to deal with that. Like, it gave me a lot of additional kind of cultural experience that I would not have had as a student, um, especially being in, like, a Japanese office environment. So, wow, fantastic. You know, it gave yeah. me a really good background, especially for going into translation. Um, but, yeah, no, I did that, and then I did my two years at Kent. Um, and then I freelanced for a bit um, before I ended up taking a position at Sig Atlas. And, and then when you started working then um, those first couple of years as a freelance translator, what was your experience of, of being a freelancer at that point? And, and from there, 
Did you experience any challenges when you eventually broke into, you know, gaming, localization? Um, yeah, what were some of the main adjustments you had to make? Yeah, well, I was really lucky um, when I went to my freelance career um, because I had I literally started freelancing the year uh, or like the summer between my first and second year of my master's program. Um, I was told to look for internships or like any agencies that I could do a little bit of work in um, just to get a little bit of experience as I was going for my master's or as I was completing my thesis. Um, and I ended up, I was reaching out to all these different LSPs, um, looking to specialize in almost tech or medical, and none of them were getting back to me. Um, and then I had a friend who was like, why haven't you applied for like any like anime stuff or like video game stuff? And I'm like, oh no, like I just want to have fun. Like that's like my hobby. I don't want to bring that into like my professional life. And I'm like, just do it. <laughs> that's good. Um, yeah. So I reached out to a whole bunch of them and uh, one of them said that Filmworks worked out, reached out to me and they're just like, yeah, we're actually looking to hire freelancers right now. Uh, we'll pay you this much. Like you want to go? And I'm like, yeah, I, I was just looking for free work, but we'll do it. Um, so I've actually been freelancing for them ever since I think, what, 2014, 2015? Um, so that worked out for me. So I was doing a little bit of work for them while also finishing my master's degree. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it worked out for me. I was like, oh, cool. Like, I got my, my first job in the industry that, you know, I am now specializing in. Um, so that was really cool. Yeah. Um, so actually, and then, of course, once I had that on my resume, getting into other LSPs or getting into other local related stuff was so much easier. Um, like, I, uh, I went to the ATA conference. Um, and I met a couple people there and they're like, yeah, no, we're working with, you know, we're an LSP that works with Netflix and we're looking for people to do trans creation for our website. And I was like, oh, well, I've done this kind of local work for this other company. And that was all I needed to say. And they're like, okay, cool. You're on our roster. Here's some work. So, um, and then the more work I got, the more I could put on my resume, which may be better for other clients. So it was really kind of almost a, like a snowballing effect at that point. Um, so yeah, it was really great. So I did, I think about 90% localization and trans creation for entertainment media for those couple of years I was full-time freelancing. Um, and then about 10% of that was public health related, um, like journals and studies and uh, grant proposals. And how was that? Sorry, just to jump in there. Sure. Like when you do the, the game, but then something completely different, like how's the mind adjustment between the two? Like, like, does it take you out of the flow? I mean, like, I guess... The game and creative part is very different from the other one. Like, Definitely. How, how does that work? I mean, I was lucky enough that um, I never had like two of those kinds of projects that were due like same day. So one day I could be doing like public health stuff, really getting myself into my terminology, and I would do all of that in MemoQ. So you know, being in a different program than like say an Excel or you know a Mem source um, was really helpful for my mindset. So I would just go through those motions, um, and then when I would go into like, okay, I got to subtitle this. Um, completely different programs, completely different documents open. Um, and yeah, I would have to get a little bit more into a creative mindset versus I always found like the public health stuff and the medical stuff a little bit more. I don't, I don't want to say it used less of my brain, but it definitely used different parts of my brain. Um, it's so but, interesting yeah. thinking about that shift as well that, you know, that you're, you're identifying there going from something like medical to, to something completely creative. And actually the fact, the point you made about switching systems might actually help with that where, you know, a lot of people would say, oh, I just want to do all of my work in one system. No, um, <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, it's like the same kind of thing as like, oh, like you put on different clothes and all of a sudden you're like, oh, like, okay, I gotta go. Like I put my business suit on, I'm feeling a little more confident yeah. and professional. So it kind of felt the same way, like, like getting into memo queue to work on my medical stuff was like putting on like the business suit um, and uh -huh. then opening up like my subtitling software. I'm like kicking off my Having shoes. A I'm like, all right, here we go, <laughs> boys, let's go. <laughs> Got it. Um, I mean, just coming back to the, the game, like game localization, entertainment localization in particular, when you were freelancing full time, uh, can you kind of pin down any specific like key characteristics in terms of the projects that you dealt with? Like what's the typical job size turnaround time? Are there any characteristics you can share? Yeah. Um, so when I was doing, I did some trans creation for an LSP working with Netflix. Those turnarounds were, I, they gave me a lot of time to work on. I would say like maybe about a week or so. It was a good workload or so, uh, or so I would say maybe about 10 to 20 hours. Um, it was good, but th there was a baby about a month where I would get like a hundred hours of work from them. And then I wouldn't hear from them for six months. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. as is typical in freelancing is that feast or famine. Um, so that was really great for me. Um, and then when I was in those famines for doing trans creation with places like Netflix or other media providers, um, I was lucky enough that the, um, the anime streaming companies I work with work on a seasonal basis. So I would be assigned a TV show that was currently airing 
Um, and then every week it'd be like, okay, like three or four days before it aired on TV, and they're like, here's the preliminary video, here's your script, produce the subtitles, um, polish them up, give it to us like two days before, and then turn it in. So I usually have about a 48-hour turnaround. Um, depending on the animation company's production schedule, of course. Um, definitely earlier in the season, they're like, cool, we finished episode one like four weeks ago, here you go. Um, and then you're getting like episode 12 or 13, and they're like, uh, we are not done. Here's our storyboards. Figure it out. Like, we'll give you the final, the final version. Like, we're basically like handing it to the TV station right as we finish the last frame of animation. So, <laughs> it's uh, it's very interesting. And there's definitely like a lot of things that can change between storyboard and animation. So it's like you know, I can't. Sometimes we had to have like a one hour delay. Be like, oh, they were a little late getting stuff to us. So uh, you know, our subtitler needs to look through and make sure they didn't change the color of something or whatnot. And that definitely happened a couple times. I had to rework some subtitles. Tell us more about you mentioned anima streaming, like yes. companies. So, so or or did they have their own channel, or are they just selling content to other kind of bigger streamers? And and yeah, and well, then, kind of both. Well, um, so yeah. um, right now, anybody who's familiar with anime or animated content coming from Japan is probably familiar. Um, the the three big players would be Funimation, you've got Crunchyroll, um, and then you've got Sentai Filmworks. Um, Netflix has also been picking up a lot of licenses lately, so they've been. Um, taking some shows and streaming them either on a weekly basis or on like a four week delay from Japan. Um, but yeah, so these are companies that are kind of like your Hulu's, kind of like your Netflix, but they specialize in a specific type of that content. Um, so you'll pay them like the $4 a month um, and you'll get same day access um, to, you know, the anime as soon as they air on Japanese TV. So it'll air on Japanese TV at 1 a.m. Japan time and it goes live at the exact same time on the website. So you can keep up with everything in real time as somebody, if you were living in Japan and just watching on TV. Wow, wow. Um, so, so okay, so time pressure is big there. But what about the? Let's talk a bit about the the language, right? I mean, Japanese is super different. Like, I mean, I lived in China for a while, and then when I went to Japan, I'm like, okay, like it's just totally different. Everything's so different. Mm -hmm. uh, I I can barely imagine how it is to translate, and then especially under time pressure. And t talk to us a little bit more about kind of the cultural components, like how kind of trans creation you can you get in these types of projects, and what are some of the key challenges just from a cultural perspective going uh, from Japanese into English? Sure. Um, well, you know, this question is something questions. I could talk like eight hours about, but I'll <laughs> go, try to condense go, it for you. <laughs> um, I think, and I'm going to specifically limit this because dep again, depending on the medium that you're translating for, it really depends. Um, for example, like with game localization, you're usually doing it, there's going to be an English dub. None of the Japanese source material is going to be available to the player. Um, so you can get a lot more creative with it. You can, you know, adjust the cultural interpretations as you need to. Um, at some cases, you can even contact the developer and be like, hey, I want to change this little visual aspect so it works better with our culture. So you have a little bit more control over what the player is going to experience as a localizer. Um, however, when you're working with video content, um, especially animated content, you know, with animation, you can do so many fantastical things. Like you can have crazy stuff popping in and out. You can have like, like almost like a music video as quality where there's like abstract things happening in the background or they zoom in on an object that really shouldn't exist. Like there's a lot of really cool stuff you could do with animation, um, but it's on screen and you can't change that. Um, so when it comes to stuff like cultural references, um, there's nothing much that I can do to to change that not only that but when you're subtitling everybody can hear what they're saying and you have a lot of people especially young people like millennials and gen z who got really into japanese through anime so they started learning a little bit of japanese so they are very loud on social media when they hear something and they're like wait that's not what the subtitle said these people don't know what they're doing and it's like no you guys like you know this is this is a skilled profession we know what we're doing we didn't change it to spite you in your japanese 101 class like this is actually what they said you just don't understand the whole the challenges of it um so yeah so definitely the medium itself presents a lot of restrictions for what you can and can't localize or can or can't transcreate um but that's for me that's part of like the fun and the challenge of it. it's like okay how do i work this so that somebody watching doesn't get confused but also is like okay that's like a weird cultural thing i think i get the joke like okay we're going here um so definitely medium Another issue that we find a lot, especially in Japanese to English, is um, the linguistic differences. Um, so first of all, Japanese is a very high context language. Um, so they will leave out, you don't have to put as much contextual clues in the actual words you're speaking because you're supposed to infer it from what's going on around you. Um, so for example, um, if in English you might say like, I eat cake. 
but all you have to do in Japanese is say cake eat. So you don't know who's eating. How many cakes are they eating? Because they don't distinguish between plural or singular. Um, it, so it's really on you to be able to look at the image or infer from who's standing around, who's got the fork in their hand, who's eating the cake, what are they doing, um, and what's, why is this important to the narrative? Ooh, excuse me, one second. Okay. But yeah, so that's, um, again, I also find that's part, a really interesting part of the translation. Um, and then finally, just to kind of close off this bit, because again, I could go out for like eight hours. Um, <laughs> the grammar structure is different as well. Um, we do uh, subject, verb, object, and then they'll do subject, object, verb. Um, so mm -hmm. a lot of their joke setups, um, especially in stuff like books or literature, or even in like like a dramatic moment where they want to say like, oh, like the person who murdered him is that guy. They might go something like, like that guy is dot 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 or that guy murdered or you know you have to really rework those sentences because those dramatic moments where they use certain words you can't do that in english because that's not how our grammar works so you really mm. have to finesse the way that you're explaining things so those dramatic moments hit right um and aren't spoiled in the subtitle before like you want to like in japanese they might be like like florian is like murder is you have to be like, <laughs> is Florian murderer is or isn't? But in, in the subtitle, you might be like, and now I know that Florian dot 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 is the murderer. So you have to really <laughs> work those dramatic drops so that they work in a completely different linguistic system. So it's that's really fun. Such, that's, so, that's so interesting. I mean, in German, it's the same. Like the verb can go at the end, like at the very, very end. And you actually don't know until the very, very end if they murdered or did not murder. You know, so uh, it's a similar challenge. These sentences can be pretty long. It's but, like a, uh, ma a major cliffhanger, isn't it? When you're like, did they? Yep. Or did it? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Or did no, they? Th there's what, the one joke that comes up all the time in Japanese media that like kills me as a translator. They'll say something and just be like, you know, I really hate you. And then they go like dot, dot, dot. And they're like, is what I would say if I did hate you. Um, <laughs> and it's always just like, oh, God, like this is just, just, it doesn't work really well in English. So you have to. Re almost rework it entirely to make it sound like because they build up that whole like to, like the, that fake out just like I'm so angry at you this 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 is what I would say but I'm not it's mm. like mm -hmm. oh, come on you guys so it's always a fun and then, and when you're making those kind of decisions I mean you mentioned quite a few of the sort of cultural references and things like that and then and then also you've got a couple of maybe competing things at play you've got the you've got the audience or the users the players who themselves might know a bit of Japanese and be really into the culture so have some kind of opinion about what should happen there mm -hmm. you've got the you know the client who's briefed you on what they want and then you know maybe also the even the original sort of script writer authors who who might have some kind of opinion on how the story should be relayed mm -hmm. I mean, do you have any tips or suggestions for how or how do you personally deal with balancing out the needs and, and maybe the preferences of those different stakeholder groups that's a really good question, um, and it's an interesting thing, especially going between uh, by two different specializations between animation and um, video games, um, because the target audience for a lot of Japanese animation, especially some of these more niche titles, um, is very much an audience that does know a little bit of Japanese. They are a little bit interested in the culture, um, but not only that, you have an audience that's very particular about what they like in translation. Um, and again, this is a thing mm -hmm. I could go on for about eight hours, um, but there's a history of fan translation of these animated um, shows that has extended past like 20, 25 years, almost 30 years now. Um, so a lot of these like, kind of long time Japanese animation fans have almost like kind of like they've kind of, I don't want to say brainwashed, but they've gotten like the wrong idea about what a translation should look like. So they expect to see these almost kind of stilted Google translate translations in the official because they think that's a better translation whereas um enjoys of other foreign media like maybe an english to french translation where they've had a lot longer history of professional like official translations being widely distributed may understand like oh yeah of course like i speak both english and french but of course they would change that from english to this in french because you know mm -hmm. they understand a little bit more how it works um so you have a lot of not only very misinformed audience members but those misinformed audience members can be very loud so you have to kind of play around and be like okay i'm going to leave in honorifics some words i'm going to leave in japanese because i know my target audience will expect those to be in japanese um 
Whereas if I was translating like for a Disney channel or for a wider distribution, obvious, like a Ghibli film, I would absolutely nuke all of those honorifics, everything would get rewritten. Like it would be much more localized for that audience. Um, so that's always really interesting. Um, but then of course on the gaming end, um, a lot of Japanese video games used to be niche, but they're really expanding out now. Um, I know there's a plenty of now Sega titles that take place in Japan that are very Japanese heavy, um, that are being available like on Xbox game pass. So anyone and their friends can go on and just be like, oh, hey, cool, there's this cool game from Japan that's free for me to play right now. I'm going to download it. I know nothing about Japan. I don't care about Japan. Um, but they want to have that same immersive, like, fun experience as somebody who was in Japan. Um, so that presents its own kind of challenges, like, okay, like, do we want to leave in all those honorifics? Do we want to leave these words in Japanese? And if we do, how are we adding, like, an explicitation or something so that our completely vanilla users who know nothing are going to, again, have that kind of same experience. So it's always a big juggle. Um, for me, I feel like my balance is more skewed towards audience. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. if the client is like, you have to do it this way, then obviously that's where I have to do it. Um, but yeah, I definitely skew towards audience uh, to the point where sometimes I do have to talk with like creators either in animation or on the development side to be like, hey, we need to change this for our audience because of X, Y, and Z. Here's the reasoning. If you have a problem with that, let's talk. Um, but like from my professional experience and also as a member of the culture, I can tell you right now this isn't going to work. Um, hmm. Hmm. So there's a lot of communication that goes by, but definitely heavily weighted towards the audience. Hmm. You, you mentioned a loud community. So is this mostly happening on Twitter or everywhere? We're picked everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> We we love we love the Twitter community like the translator Twitter community right there's so many and they have like tens of thousands of followers so okay everywhere all right so on yeah, Twitter so, and I mean on Twitter Facebook any social media site I mean and there's social media sites that are created just for things like Japanese animation and whatnot um and they're all very loud about their opinions on what they like in translation um it's a very interesting community to be part of because I grew up in that community and I did start with a lot of misinformed opinions about how translation should be and then as soon as i got into translation started learning a bit more about that and not only just that but like the philosophy and theory i started realizing like oh like that's why we do it this way that's why we shouldn't do it like this that's why this has always sounded weird to me um so it's very interesting transitioning from somebody who was maybe at 14 or 15 years old absolutely had those misinformed opinions coming into where i am now where i could talk to those people and be like no no i was just like you i swear i know what i'm doing it, it Okay, so it's so hard to find a segue from this, but <laughs> let's talk about MT and productivity. Like oh what you're describing, there is so much thinking going on. There's so much like audience dependency. Like you're thinking about, okay, are these kind of the older guys that are, you know, the 30 year anime fans, et cetera. And then there's this new cohort coming in that's playing on the cloud, yada, yada. Yeah. I mean, how does MT help, if anything, at all? Like, oh, boy. Can, I have a lot of feelings about MT um, and localization. Um, and anybody who's followed me on Twitter, share. absolutely. They've seen a lot of my threads about it. Um, and I think my my big quote that I always say with MT is, like, look, MT is like anything. It's a tool. Um, but you have to use the right tool for the right situation. Like, you're not going to use a jackhammer to pin a painting to the wall. Um but you will use a jackhammer to break open a bunch of concrete. Um, so depending on what you need to do, MT can be great or it can completely wreck it. Um, one example that we have in the game industry is we're seeing a lot of kind of indie devs or other kind of developers that are not big in AAA. Um, and this does happen in AAA studios as well. Like I'm not excluding them. Um, but a lot of these developers are deciding, well, localization is not as important. So we're going to cut costs, run it through MT, have like one guy touch it up and then plug it into our game. Um, and then of course they get a whole bunch of backlash from it. Um, like Spanish users are like, dude, this is unplayable. Like the, the option to say yes or no is like using the wrong thing or say like play the game is using the wrong verb for play. Like this is the one that you would use to play like a baseball game, not to play a video game. Um, but of course MT can't tell the difference because they were just given a single strain, strain that says play. Mm -hmm. um, so um, there's a lot of cost cutting measures being used through MT. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of developers are under this opinion. It's like, well, MT is good enough. Um, when really it's not like it's, it's almost an insult to the audience. Cause they're like, well, this is completely unplayable in my language. Like, how dare you advertise this as having full fig support when really you just threw it through Google translate. Like that's not fig support. Like fig support would be a dedicated French, Italian, German, Spanish translator 
who knows what game terminology should be like, who knows what the audience for that language expects. Um, and especially for games like, I mean, if it's like a Tetris or something like, okay, yeah, there's not a lot of dialogue. There's not a lot of intense story going on, but you've got, especially with these AAA studios, you've got these big cinematic adventures coming out. I mean, you've got like your Lara Croft, like uh, you have your Far Cry. I mean, Last of Us 2, just these huge narrative adventures. Like you really, you can't throw that into MT and expect to get something good out. Um, that's not to say that MT doesn't have its place, you know, as a tool here and there. Um, I would definitely see MT at use for like internal documents, or you know, if you got a budgeting report from your developer, you got to pass on super quick. MT is great for that. Um, MT can be good as well um, as a plugin, like in a memo queue or in a Trados, um, because it can add that extra kind of parsing. Like if you're having a really hard time parsing a sentence, especially in Japanese, you can get these very long sentences, and the grammar is so different from ours. Like you really have to kind of pick it apart piece by piece be like, okay, where exactly does each piece go? You have to, again, a high context language, so I have to open up the game and see exactly what's going on in the background to see who's doing what. Um, so MT can be great as an additional resource to be like, okay, this is what MT thinks is going on. It's wrong about most of it, but this part gives me a clue. Um, so it can be, again, it's a tool that can be very helpful, uh, but when it comes to localizing game content in any language, um, it's just not advanced enough to be able to interpret not only the context of text in the game uh, environment, but also the needs of the audience um, and the audience's cultural expectations. Um, so it's definitely not quite there yet, um, but who knows, you know, I mean, once if they can build an MTAI that can, you know, get to the point where it understands that culture like that, it can look at a game screenshot and understand, oh, this is this part of the game where this is happening, so this word means referring to this character who's an ice mage who uses this. So it's, again, I think it's way too complex for any time soon to us see, to, for us to see anything coming out of MT in terms of pop your game into an MT engine and you've got a perfectly localized game. Yeah, that's uh, that's a lot of advanced AI uh, and yeah. a lot of activities. <laughs> you you mentioned indie versus AAA, uh, uh, you know, publishers. Like you mentioned some differences in MT, but what are other kind of differences and similarities when when you work for them or localize games for indie versus AAA? Um, it's I mean, if you have a bigger team, it's I feel like communication can be a little bit more difficult. You typically when you're working with indie devs, um, it's a much smaller team. They're a lot more close knit in terms of communication. Um, which can be good if you're like, hey, this asset, we might need to change the color because a lot of our players over on the side like care about colorblind settings. Or, hey, this this element here has been flagged by our German team because it may not, like, German audiences might recognize it as, like, an offensive symbol or something like that. Um, so we need to rework it. Um, and the indie developers will be have a lot easier time being like, okay, cool, yeah, like, the dude who designs the assets right next to me, I'll have him change that. Um, versus when you're working with a AAA studio, they're like, okay, well, i got to pass it on to the art director. Art director needs to now talk to the team. Team needs to figure out what, how they're going to change that. So it might take a little bit of time to turn around that, especially if they're working on, you know, crunching to get the game out. They might be like, yeah, we'll get back to you on that next month. We'll see you. Um, so, so there's that difference. Um, but I think also another difference we see between indie and AAA, and again, this, is, this really depends on the studio, um, is how much value they put on localization. Um, hmm. Some indie devs, um, they may be very early into the industry. They may be like, oh, like, you know, I just want to focus on getting my game out. Like, localization would be cool, but it's not something I have any experience in. I don't really know what would be good. Um, like, you guys, you guys sort it out, like, whatever, whatever is fine. So they don't do a lot of quality assurance on their end, or they really don't put as much importance on getting localization into the final result. Um, and I would say more of my experience working with larger studios has been like, yeah, no, like, we absolutely want the localization and like, you know, we want to market this in as many countries as possible. Like, yes, let's get the facial capture in for every language. Yes, let's get the audio for every language. Um, like, of course, we can change this like string layout to work better for FIGS languages. Um, and that's usually because I have a little bit more experience being like, yeah, no, like not only is localization something we want to do for our game, but they understand how important it is to like their budgetary model or to the mm. success of their game. Um, Cause it, like any piece of media that you're localizing, like a good localization is a profit enhancer. Um, it makes everything better for you on your end. Um, but a bad localization, um, on the worst end, like you pay for a, you pay for a bad localization and you don't get much back from it, or you get a bad localization and then everybody just 
tanks on your game. It's just like, dude, what you guys, you threw this to Google Translate. What is wrong with you? Do you have no respect for the people of Spain or for the entire Spanish speaking community if they're doing like Latin American Spanish? Like, come on, guys. So it's very, um, it's very interesting. But I don't, I wouldn't say like there's great indie developers who understand the value of localization and there's AAA publishers who are just like, yeah, well, whatever. They'll buy it anyways because it's, you know, AAA title. Like, so just throw it through whatever the cheap, the lowest possible bidder for LSP. We'll get it back and they'll play it anyways and we'll just patch it later if they don't like it. So um, it really depends on the developer you're working with, but um, it's always it's always an adventure. And and then what about on the agency side? If you're freelancing, you know, for a massive multi-language, multi-sector language service provider versus, you know, I don't know, some some smaller either single language or like super specialized in in your area uh agency do you do you observe any differences between you know that those types of people as um as as your clients your immediate clients um i can't speak too much for this because i've only done some freelancing um and i've worked with some mm. agencies um working in-house as well um i can say like the more specialized the agency the typically the higher quality you're going to get. I mean, if you have an agency that's specialized in public health translation, you're going to get translators who are contracted through them that are specialized in public health and do public health all the time. So it's going to be a much higher quality translation just because you're paying for the skill. And usually there's a, you're paying a little bit more extra for it. Um, whereas compared to if you're going to one of the, like we support 100 languages, we have like 10,000 translators, we talk to each of them like once a year um, or once every mm -hmm. two years. Um, then the quality you're going to get is much lower, I find. Um, which is unfortunate because, especially with something like game translation, like it's so highly contextual, um, it's so highly creative that you can't just farm it out to the lowest possible bidder. You really have to find the right group of either in-house people or freelancers or an LSP that can connect you with people who are not only passionate about what they're doing, but have the skills and you know professional competencies to not only be able to translate it but know when to ask questions because frequently when we work with lsps they do not get a copy of like the game beta uh, we give mm -hmm. them the text and say if you have questions talk to us um so we'll get hundreds of thousands of questions over the course of game development where it's like hey yeah. what color shirt is this guy wearing or like is especially from our figs languages is this character male or female um because that's going to affect the adjectives. That's going to affect literally everything in the scene. Is the teacher she mentions a girl or a boy? And I'm like, well, the teacher never shows up. She just kind of casually mentions her teacher told her this. You can assume that it's female. You can assume that it's male. Um, there's a lot. Of, I would say about 90% of my questions from my Spanish team are all, you know, is this female or male? Um, which makes sense. <laughs> um, especially because in Japanese, they don't use pronoun markers like that. You know? Mm -hmm. So gender, gender doesn't pop up. And that's another thing. Sorry, this is a weird segue, but that's another thing they do all the time in Japanese media is like, because they don't say he or she, because they can just talk about, oh, yeah, and then Yamamoto-san told me this, Yamamoto-san told me that. So people will assume, oh, Yamamoto-san must be a guy. Then Yamamoto-san shows up like six hours into the story. Surprise, Yamamoto-san's like super cute girl. And everyone's like, I thought you, like, they said you were like a fighter and like super badass. And she's like, yeah, I am. I am. So, yeah. But so they play a lot Surprise. on those those assumptions with gender, and that's a huge thing. It's not only just the English, but fix. It's like great. So we're so, like Yamamoto-san's gender is supposed to be a big reveal, but all of our adjectives mm -hmm. for Yamamoto-san are gendered in Spanish. Like, come on! So it's always a really interesting, uh, interest, interesting thing to be like, okay, Spanish. Like, we're gonna figure this out. Don't worry about it. <laughs> How about confidentiality and security when you're working on a game? Like, obviously, at some point it's public, and then, well, translation's there, and you know you're you're debating it. But like, while games are being developed and and localized, is that a huge thing? Like, uh, and like you lock people, <laughs> some proprietary I mean, systems or something. There's there's been certain game projects where we have had to lock people in rooms and be like this this like particular like part of the story like if it's a really big game franchise it's like this is a huge spoiler like like we're gonna kill off like obi-wan kenobi like no one can know like not even people at your company because we don't want that to leak out um so there have been cases where it's like yeah i haven't seen those guys in six months they've been locked in, the, in they've been locked in the meat locker in the office in the back like we haven't seen them um hopefully it's something really cool and then of course it comes down you're like oh that's why they got locked in the meat locker okay um, but we do have issues, um, especially with leaks in the game industry, because obviously when you're working with something story oriented or, you know, you've got a big franchise coming out, like if we we're making like a sequel to Star Wars, like we don't want to 
drop that before our marketing rep is ready to make that big marketing beat. Um, but there's so many moving parts working on it. We have to make sure everybody is like, you know, don't bring, don't leave your stuff unattended at home. Don't download stuff on your home computer. Like, just don't talk to people about it. Like, just be, just be really careful who you talk to about stuff. Um, so yes, yeah, so there is an issue with making sure that we keep stuff locked down. Um, but it's not always perfect. I mean, stuff always leaks out a little bit. Well, I wouldn't say always, but there's always some sort of, you know, you, we submit something for ratings and something's like, oh, like this game company just submitted a code name for a rating. Like now all the fans are jumping on and being like, what title is this? What title is this? Is this a Star Wars game? Is this a Star Wars game? Um, and then if we've got other issues with like a like uh, LSP we work with doesn't realize that the work that we did they did for us isn't technically out of NDA yet. So they go, oh, hey, we worked on the new Star Wars game. And it's one random user who's like looking maybe for a job on the LSP is like, holy shit, they're doing a Star Wars game? Oh my God. And they screen cap the website. It's all over Twitter. And then we wake up and we're like, ah, geez. Like now it's this, the cat's out of the bag. Like we, it's not like we're going to drop our marketing beat, but now we got to like make some calls and be like, you guys, it's not out yet. Come on. So, um, yeah, dealing with leaks is always a uh, is always a concern, but I don't think yeah. there's only been a couple instances where uh, that I know where either you know somewhere at at the places that I've worked or where my friends have worked, they're like, oh yeah, no, we were we were locked in that room for like six months, six to, six months to like a year because nobody could know what we were doing. Uh, yeah. okay. It's always it's it's always interesting, but at the same time, it's like, ooh, can't wait to get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> What do you think at the moment about the availability of, of the talent pool for for translators generally? I mean, are there enough translators, uh, you know, specialized in the area uh, to keep it, to sustain the demand and the growth in demand? Or are there any, you know, air pockets uh, in the industry, whether that's languages or sort of specific niches that are really challenging to, to source for? Uh, that's a good question. Um, it's something I'm really passionate about recently. Um... I can only speak for Japanese to English. I'm not as mm. um, I'm not as familiar with efakes or for other Asian languages to English translation. Um, I can say that there is no shortage of translators who are highly skilled at localization, whether it's of film media, animated media, or game media. Um, there's lots of us out here, um, but the issue that we're facing is that companies are not willing to pay the additional rates for a skilled translator, they would rather pay a lowest common denominator. Um, we see this a lot, I would say, both in the games industry um, and in the animation industry, because this is one where a lot of translators want to work in it. Um, so you have your skilled translators like me or like other people who've been in the industry for 20, 30 years who are like, hey, I, I worked on the original Final Fantasy. Like, I've worked on so many games, but I want to be paid this much. Um, a game company might look at someone who's like, hey, I'm just out of college, I'm 19, or like, I'm, I'm 22, and I love anime and games, like, my Japanese isn't that good, but like, I will take minimum wage just to work on a Final Fantasy game. And, they, and the company might be like, I'll pay them the minimum wage, and I'll have like, the one guy look over like, the 10 pe like, newbie people's translations, and then we'll put that out. Um, mm. And so it's really hard... Um, for a for skilled translators to be able to find work because they're like look you guys aren't valuing the experience and the skill that we bring um you know um we've seen that all all over with netflix um with other streaming providers um where they are going to these lsps that are paying the lowest common denominator um i know there was some controversy with i think this oh gosh i can't remember what language it was but when squid game came out there were a couple languages that were highly criticized because it's just like these translations don't make any sense you guys obviously didn't do any quality assurance on it what's going on and then of course it comes out that the lsp was paying like two dollars per per running minute for episodes so the translator was literally getting paid like a hundred dollars to do an episode of subtitles whereas somebody like me or one of my other colleagues might have charged like 400 to 500 dollars for the same job um, Netflix is like, well, I'll cut my costs because this LSP is going to be char is going to be asking for way less, um, and we'll let them handle it, and hopefully it'll be good enough. Um, and the LSP is just like, you, you'll do it for the cheapest. Here you go, translate this episode. Um, so yeah, it's it's really unfortunate because you know, especially with these highly specialized, highly creative um, localizations for like subtitling or dubbing scripts or video games, um, it's so important to have somebody who understands. Not only like the target audience, but also the history of the audience, kind of like with the, the whole anime thing of like knowing that the audience has those people who are, 
you know, looking, picking apart your translation or trying to understand the Japanese behind it, um, as well as current trends in gaming, like, okay, we're not using play or stop, we're using play or pause. Um, these are all things that, you know, either a machine translation or very inexperienced translator who's, get, who's asking for a lower rate would not completely understand is very important. But somebody who has more experience would be like, oh, yeah, no, that's, that's like a day one mistake you would make. Like, come on, guys. Um, so, yeah, so we, we have no dearth of talent um, or experienced translators. The biggest issue we're facing right now in our industry is a combination of LSPs that are refusing to say, like, hey, we have skilled translators, and if you pay us a little bit more, we'll give you a better job. Um, and media companies that do not value localization as part of their media package. So it's, that's uh, the weird part. I don't know. I get that the vendors just want to <laughs> boost their bottom line. I don't get why media companies would not understand that. Okay, man, you poured all this money into the original, like, like you know, obviously you're going to localize it, and you know, there's 80 million Germans that are going to watch this, and there's mm -hmm. you know X amount of Koreans that are going to look at it. Uh, and also, it's something that I find a little weird because it's kind of it. It was solved 40, 50 years ago. Like when I look, when I watch like old German dub content, I mean, the, the dubbing and the translations are absolutely amazing. I mean, like they invented, like, for example, Bill and Ted, if you remember that, like yes. ancient, like it was basically, they created almost like a new language, right? And they invented like words in German that almost like they weren't there before. And it was just all kind of the dubbing, uh, you know, translation studio. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's like, you can't, you can't do it. it. It was done 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Oh, so. yeah. And we see yeah. this, I, I would say, primarily in uh, Western Anglo-centric companies. Um, and this kind of goes back um, both to some stuff that I've read and also a great talk done by Pablo Romero Fresco um, back in ATA 2017, 2018. Um, I quote him all the time. He's a fantastic guy out of Spain. Like, it does amazing research on um, uh, film and subtitling and translation theory uh, during filmmaking to improve the audience experience with localization. But one of the things that um, we see a lot, especially in these Anglo-centric companies, is that um, stuff coming, uh, so much media, uh, at least that has been popularized in that sphere, was created in English in that culture. So we, in the last 50 to 100 years, as kind of like Western Americans or Canadians or whatnot, we don't have a culture where we grew up watching stuff dubbed. We didn't watch stuff that was subtitled. Um, on the opposite, we grew up in a culture where we were making fun of like, oh, the Godzilla subtitles are so bad, or like the dub has like the lip flaps and he says one word. Um, we have a lot of those jokes about like, oh, like look at this terrible English on this Chinese menu, like the translation's so bad. Like we almost have this culture of mocking translation, being like, like oh, bad translation's hilarious, but we almost don't consume anything translated at all. Um, it's only been recently, yeah. I would say in the f last five to ten years, that we're seeing foreign stuff become more popularized. Like, um, if you had told me ten years ago, like, yeah, Korean drama is going to be the biggest hit of 2021, I'd be like, you're, you're kidding me. Like, you can't get a whole, like, 300 million Americans to watch a Korean drama subtitled. Like, you kidding me? They'll never watch that. And, of course, we had Squid Game, which is fucking huge. Um, so, yeah, so we don't have that culture of you know, expecting to watch 80 to 90% of our media translated, as opposed to like in Japan, yes, they have their own film industry, but a good 50% of the offerings in theaters are going to be stuff produced in Hollywood with Japanese subtitles or a Japanese dub on it. So they grow up watching stuff dubbed and subtitled. Um, and because not only that culture is there, but that industry is then there, shaped by that culture for so long, um, they understand, like, yes, like, of course we want to pay our translator a little bit more. Of course we want to have a good look. Because they look back 50 or 60 years, and they're like, yo, we don't want to go back to that. Um, and we're just starting to go through that cultural renaissance. We're like, oh, like, um, almost that kind of xenophobic, oh, other countries can make stuff as good as we make them. Um, so I think we really need to get over that um, and start, we have to almost go through that whole history of, oh, we can't just pay for the bottom line of translation, because when you invest in translation, it will make us more money kind of thing. So we need to go through our own moment with that, I think, before we start seeing LSPs um, and media companies start to value more of that localization or media translation. Because um, the impact of like a badly translated medical document is very immediate. Like you, You'll get the manufacturer coming back and just be like, you guys translated this the complete opposite way. You're going to kill people with these medicine instructions. Like, what the hell is wrong with you? Versus like if you have a really bad machine translation, it's very difficult, difficult to gauge the impact of that um, both on your audience and on your bottom line. So anyways, I, like I said, I could go on about this forever, but it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's very much a cultural thing. 
Um, and it's something that I think as like uh, Anglo-centric Americans, like we have to work through before we start realizing, oh, like there's value in good loke. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about briefly before we uh, end on uh, a recent hype, metaverse, VR and localization, real, not real, perennial future. I don't know. Facebook's hiring a ton of people here in Zurich uh, for, <laughs> for their kind of metaverse thing. So what are your thoughts on that? So as someone who grew up online, uh, this whole like like Facebook trying to claim like, oh, that they have a metaverse is like so ridiculous to me because like I grew up playing RuneScape. I grew up playing MMOs. Like I play Final Fantasy 14. Like that is it's already a metaverse. Like we we rock around with our characters like there's in Final Fantasy 14 alone. You've got like whole guilds that will do like ballet productions or like full productions of Shakespeare you know, just with their characters and what the game has constrained. So, uh, and we see this going back all the way to like EverQuest and stuff from like the early 1990s where people are logging in and like having these full communities online with their own avatars and whatnot. So this is absolutely not a new thing. Like Facebook is trying to make it seem like it's a new thing, but like, no, we've been doing this for 30 years, you guys, come on. Um, obviously VR is the one new thing that they're bringing into it. Mm -hmm. Like you're going to put on yeah. your VR headset and now you're kind of being in the, you know, whatever. you have no um, legs. <laughs> Yeah. Did you well, see that? <laughs> well, you can have legs and you can have legs in EverQuest, so you know they're behind on that about thirty years. Um, but no, I think I think with VR localization is really interesting, um, and there's this such it's such a new field that we're really seeing. Like, how do you put subtitles on something you're supposed to experience in VR? Where do yeah. you put the mm -hmm. subtitles if the, the literally the person who's playing the game can look around, they can interact with stuff, um, and they're supposed to be hearing something from the person who's talking behind them? Um, how do you create not only where do you put the subtitles, but how you create an equivalent experience for that person um, that's not a dub, because um, not everybody wants to play stuff dubbed. Not only that, but you have players that um, are hard of hearing or you know can't experience a dub, or so they need to have the subtitles or closed captions. Like where are you going to put those in a VR experience? Um, and then of course localizing assets for VR, um, it almost goes one step further. It's like okay, well if you want to change the graphic text, the graphic text is now not just like a flat asset that you're slapping onto a polygon that they'll maybe walk past, uh, but this is something that they can interact with. They can go all the way around to see what's going on. So there's a lot more moving parts that need to be um, kind of messed with. Um, I think it'll be really interesting to see, um, but. Yeah. Are uh, these assets terms, like heavy? Right. Sorry, like are these assets like heavy? I mean, how do you like are these files? I have no idea. Like if you do a VR, like is there like a terabyte file coming across or definitely or how does not? That work? Um, like like for example, like if I'm doing graphic text for a game, they'll usually send me like like an Excel file or something that's like okay, here's okay. all the graphics that have text on them, translate them, and then we send that to our designer and we'll design it in your language, um, and then you tell us if it's good or not, like what we need to change. Um, Got it. But I can okay. say like for these assets. Um, probably in the localization phase, it would be about the same, but I can see in the QA phase it being a lot more annoying to work with, because um, your QA testers are going to try and break your VR, um, and yeah, I, I, there's a lot more interesting ways they can break stuff in VR, because they can just like try to put their head into different objects, they can move stuff around, they can see, can I manipulate this, um, so I think there's there's going to be a lot of really interesting localization and QA issues with VR. Um, but specifically pertaining to the metaverse, like if Facebook's big idea is like, oh, I want to have this metaverse where people can log in and interact with people. Um, if they want to have interaction between people of different languages, I think that's going to be really difficult until AI is advanced enough to do stuff like, you, you know, all the context, the contextual parsing for high context languages um, and just being able to accurately parse language. Um, hmm. It'll be interesting, though. I'm, I'm interested to see what they do with it. But again, I'm not really... I'm not super sold because again, I've been I've been in a metaverse for thirty years. Like, yeah, what do you bring well, into the, the table, Facebook? Uh, well, a lot of money, first of all. So, uh, <laughs> <For sure. laughs> got plenty of that. All right, Katrina, that was fascinating. Where do people find you on Twitter? Uh, my they Twitter need to handle you. is uh, Katrina Translator. I think it's stylized like T R N S L H R. Um, but if you just search for like Katrina Leonidakis on Twitter, I'll pop up. Um, I tweet a lot awesome. about. I try not to tweet like too much personal stuff, uh, but I do tweet a lot about like the anime and manga industry because I'm in there. Um, some video game stuff as well. Anything that I've worked on, I'll talk about. Um, and I think recently I've been talking a lot about um, cultural context, um, equivalent experience, um, and I'm really fascinated by translation theory. So 
every once in a while, especially I talked about how our, our community in the anime and manga community for, for Japanese English is very loud. So somebody might be like, hey, why did they translate this this way? I hate it. Um, and a lot of us will chime in and be like, well, actually, like, that's a really cool question because it's like this whole facet of like Scopos theory. And we like, yeah, no, it's super nerdy. But if you're into that, like. Please. Yeah, absolutely. Our listeners must follow account. So, thank you. All right. Katrina, thank you so much for doing this. This was fascinating. This was really, really interesting. Yeah, thank Thanks you for, for having me. All thank right. You. Take care. Bye bye.